I had the idea last summer, I don't know where I was, that I should start out class by, uh, I should start out a, a, a semester by getting you all to tell each other and to tell me what you know and what you don't know. Because one of the, the things in this, this world of certainly talking about race relations is, um, or talking about the, a lot of the issues that we're discussing, is that we, sometimes we have the idea that people, people know things that, that they don't know because, um, or I don't know, we, we just don't really understand how much people really understand about certain issues. And, and, and I certainly don't have any idea like what you know and what you don't know. And, you know, the, the, the thing is in the, in the world of kind of social media and the web and so on, um, it's easy to sometimes imagine that people are, um, yeah, I don't know that people know a lot. Okay, first one is this. The Trump, my wife actually started calling the border wall the Trump. She's saying it should just be Trump. A Trump. We're going to build a Trump. That's, isn't that, that's a perfect name for a border wall, right? It's a Trump. Oh, hey, by the way, I should say something at the very first, the very second day. Um, you know how I said on Tuesday that you, people who are, Liberals sometimes think I'm too conservative, and people who are conservative think I'm too liberal. Uh, people also assume that, of course, I'm teaching a class on race relations. And, of course, you know, we had Barack Obama as our first half-black president. And, of course, I voted. I must have voted for him. I didn't vote for Obama, okay? I didn't vote for Hillary either. I didn't vote for Trump. So you... Don't make assumptions about a lot of things in this world, right? So just keep that in mind. However, because whoever is in power is the one I'm going to kind of make fun of a little bit, right? It's like the talk show hosts, you know, in the evening monologues. They're not making fun of Obama anymore because Trump's president, so they make fun of him. And when, Ob when Obama was president, they weren't making fun of George Bush. And when Bush was president, they weren't making fun of... George Clinton from, or Bill Clinton, whatever, <laughs> Parliament, Funkadelic, you know what I mean? So you might hear me make, make a, f a few more cracks about Trump, but like, that's because he's the dude in the White House. I'm not going to talk about Obama because he's gone, right? He's done. He's done his thing. So keep that in mind, right? So when I make a joke about, yeah, we're going to call this the Trump, well, I made jokes about Obama too. But that was then. Now we're in a different world. So we have a different president. Okay, who wants to come up and tell us what you know? And, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to, I'm going to give you the microphone. And I want you to take a few minutes and pretend like you have to teach the class something about the border wall. And you just kind of put it in perspective and say something, right? The border wall or border security. You can pick any of those out. Just what is it? What's it about? How is it about? And how do you make sense of it? So what's your name? Uh, my name is Mason. What is it? Mason. Mason? Yeah. You can stand. You can, I left the table here because sometimes it's yeah, more comfortable sitting. So give us the, um, you know, you don't have to go too far, but give us the, give us the border wall. Well, what, what are the issues? What's up? Just go. Um, the border wall is something that Trump is requesting $5 billion for. Um, I personally think it's really fucking stupid. No, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. No, well, you know you can't. No, no, no. Okay, hang on. You ready? Trump supporters, you had your opportunity and you didn't raise your hand. So, right? That could have been you. You could have been like, yeah, I personally think it was really awesome, but you know, whatever. And. But you didn't, so there you go. What's that? Oh, dude, sorry, man. All right, so listen. Um, yeah, you can't say that. Okay. You pretend you're okay. me, right? Okay. Um, so essentially, the goal behind it is to cut down on illegal immigration, but a large issue with the wall is that a lot of illegal immigrants don't come through, like, through the border. A lot of them enter through um, airports and other things. They're not just climbing walls to get here. Um, on top of that, it's uh, a lot of people think it's inhumane 
Um, we're supposed to be a country that's a melting pot of culture, and we're shutting out people who are coming to us because they are looking for shelter and for a safer place to live. So that's a big thing that's frowned upon. Um, anybody, anybody have a question for her? I have a question. How many people would you let in then if you don't have a wall? Like how many people would you say like, hey, okay, you can come in? From like, from like everywhere or like? Yeah, like you don't have a wall. Them. You're just going to open the, how about it, Trump people? I got you on this one, right? <laughs> yeah, like, well, how many are you going to let in? Um, I don't Ms. Really liberal? Yeah. So it gets misconstrued that if you don't want a border wall, you just want open borders. But that's not a lot. That's not a case a lot of the times. Obviously, I want our country to be safe. And uh, there are issues with immigration. Every There's issues with every sort of system in America. Um, but I believe that a wall isn't going to fix everything. But I also don't know an exact number of how many people to let in. Uh huh. Yeah. Imagine you did, though. Um, I don't know. I would say that everyone, like in an ideal world, everyone who wanted to come here and wanted to like prosper and stuff would be able to come. That would be my solution. But you can't. That's not feasible. Okay. So that would mean also, by the way, that you. Unless you're like a really amazing student, it's possible you I'm wouldn't not. be going to Penn State because yeah. someone else would have taken your position. Is that cool? That is cool because I think that it's also important to look at the privilege that got me to the place where I am today. I'm clearly white, so I have like privilege because I'm white. Um, that's oh. just be I, just because that like other immigrants were coming here doesn't mean that they were taking my spot. Right. If they were better than me at school or at uh, I don't know other shit like it would they should deserve to be here instead of me Okay, if how about what would you anybody else have a question for come on any Trump people a, you like want to throw something out? I have a question from the stream. Yeah, okay. Go ahead, man uh, Who's gonna pay for all of those Mexicans without jobs or places to stay? Well, not just Mexicans either by the way. Yeah. Uh, exactly. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank you, whoever asked that on the stream. A lot of times illegal immigrants who are here are, also, are actually taking the jobs that Americans don't want or are too proud to take. So they actually help our economy. That's also something that's incredibly overlooked is that illegal immigration doesn't only just strain our economy. It also helps in a lot of aspects. Okay, people who are less in inclined to support open immigration, you have your chance to ask a question or forever hold your peace. Because that was like, that is such an open answer right there. Anyone want to ask something? You all like anybody? Listen, man, yo, conservatives, can I just put something out to you? There is this place at Penn State where conservatives learn to be quiet because you get shut down. And it just saw when she said her piece about, I think it's effing stupid or whatever, and then she got applause. And so some of you don't think it's effing stupid. Some of you think it's a really good idea. And you think if I stand up and say that, I'm going to get booed or something. Well, you're not. That's not what this class is. So conservatives, you have to learn to, to make your points, to articulate your arguments and put them out there. And I'm not talking to just white conservatives. There are a lot of conservatives in here who are black and brown. So does anybody want to pose a question to her? A lot of conservatives don't necessarily oppose wanting people finding a better life. They just find it disgusting to, like, uh, you know, avoid all law and order and, like, force your way into our country and have no respect for our laws that we all have to follow. Hey, hang on. I'm gonna, I, I just change your word, swap out your word disgusting with just problematic. Yeah, I didn't mean to use disgusting. They just, no, they just find Forgive it me. problematic. It's just a better word, problematic. Problematic. Yeah. Um, so something that I think is interesting that is the fact that how difficult it is to become a citizen. I understand that we need to have some sort of system in place, but it costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of time. And for a lot of people who are coming from countries where they're in dire need to get out and to find a safer place to live, they're not going to be worried about following laws. They're going to be worried about keeping their family safe. So I think that a good place to start would to be to re revisit our immigration process. Why is it so expensive to come here when they're going to get here and they're going to pay taxes like every other citizen. Um, I personally think that's the first place we should start because it could be something that could help a lot of people. What's your name? Uh, Jonathan. What is it? Jonathan. Jonathan? Yeah. Where are you from? Uh, I was born and raised in Ethiopia. In Ethiopia? Yeah. Dude, I was going to say that. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, we met before. Yeah, okay. So go for it. So um, this, uh, I, I chose this topic because I'm very interested in technology. Hold, hold and, the uh, mic close. Uh, I'm very interested in technology and uh, looking at what, uh, especially China, China's domination when it comes to uh, our uh, um, 
our dominance when it comes to uh, technology, especially Silicon Valley. And uh, what we are seeing now is the, uh, the copying of technology without uh, respecting any of our patent laws uh, that are set up uh, in this country. So uh, especially, uh, especially uh, any technology that uh, is, pr uh, uh, is built and manufactured, developed by taxpayer uh, money in America is being copied without any regulation or without any type of control in foreign countries, which is a disadvantage for United, uh, uh, the United States' own interests. So, um, especially when it comes to uh, uh, copying uh, American uh, intellectual values and um, uh, manufacturers. So that's where you would go. What else, man? Do you know who those, you know who the photos are? Uh, that is the, uh, the richest person in China. So he has uh, the Amazon of China, and he leads a lot of um, e-commerce. Do you know his name? Um, no. No. I, I, I can't. Jack Ma. Yeah. Do you know who those the other? Uh, uh, BTS? Right? What's that? Is, that? is that the? Uh, uh, yeah, BTS. Yeah, you know who they are? Uh, K-pop uh, group. Right? Yeah. Um, Can you say something about that? Uh, did you say, can I, can I say? Do you know anything about them? Um, I know they came here uh, about a year ago, uh, and they can dance. <laughs> <laughs> they look like they can dance. <laughs> All right, man. Anybody have a question for him about China and Korea? I just want to know, like, uh, do you feel that it's important that we try to maintain a positive relationship with China since they have uh, such a strong effect on, like, the U.S. markets and, like, the global markets? Dude, nice uh, question. All right. Uh, this, uh, this is uh, my opinion, right? Uh, so the, your question ties back to uh, what's happening with China right now, the trade war yeah. and everything that is being uh, uh, solved. So in my, in my, in a, this is my opinion, and I believe that uh, uh, pushing towards and putting more effort and uh, uh, getting the American people what they deserve is the right thing to do when it comes to our foreign relationship. Uh, I, I think the trade war sh is definitely important for it to happen, and it, it was bound to happen uh, during this administration or the past administration. Because uh, if you globally, if you look at globally, or if you look at, look at everywhere, uh, we are losing most of our uh, uh, special interests, and thus it comes down to uh, this country. All right. So listen, man. All the liberals in here who clapped when the uh, Mason made the anti-Trump statement. He just made a pro-Trump statement. So, liberals. Oh, hold up, hold up. <laughs> yeah, let me. Uh, <laughs> I think, I think he was trying to say. Being a thing, no, 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 no. Being a pro-Trump. I mean, the when, when it comes to trade war and our trade relationship, like Obama showed the same thing. Uh, the, the Democratic Party also holds the same uh, yeah. values. Uh, being pro-Trump has a lot, a lot into it. So it comes with a lot. No, no, no. I got no, no, no. You, so, you just uh, made no, no, no. Hang on. You I'm made an argument in support of Trump's actions. This is, it's like anything. Anybody who's in power, you know, you, you. It's just like me. Remember, I said half of what I say you'll agree with, and half of what I say you'll disagree with. Half of Trump, if you actually really paid attention to what he's doing and what he's saying, I, I can almost guarantee that ha half of what he does, almost all of you would agree with. Yeah. And the other half would disagree with, and the other half not. And they, and the same with Obama. So. Personally, personally, when it comes to like the economy and how the economy should operate, I rely, uh, I align myself more to the conservative side because anyone who has a reasonable way of thinking when it comes to the economy. All right, man. Any, all right, cool. All right. Anybody else? Um, so this question specifically is about China. So um, in China, they've started implementing like a social rating system kind of like a credit score type thing where if you're a good or bad person and it can kind of influence your like freedoms, whether you can buy like train tickets or plane tickets or do certain things in society. Um, even though that's in China, is that something we should be like worried about here? Uh, Dude, nice question, by the way. So in my opinion, uh, that, uh, that kind of uh, what you just described uh, aligns more uh, mostly to a social, uh, socialism school of thought 
and I completely disagree with social, uh, socialism at all. Uh, so uh, when it comes to controlling the mass and dividing uh, the, ma uh, the mass population and trying to regulate it uh, uh, gives the elites uh, more power. And I disagree with giving any power to anyone if it impacts me, uh, me and everyone else around me. So. Dude, oh, my God. That's a big statement right there. All right. We're going to move on to the next topic. Nice job, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Islam and violence. So, oh, you can't be Muslim and answer this either. I guess a couple of things to say to start off. I'm not Muslim. I haven't. I don't really know a lot about Islam besides the fact that I just got back from Jordan and Palestine for the last three weeks, which is where I was backpacking. And I only went because I didn't really know anything about the Middle East, like I've never been to the Middle East. So I kind of went only knowing what the US media was telling us. And I mean, it, the bias is insane. So I think a couple interesting things to point out is I was in Palestine, where obviously they're Muslim, but they're right next to Israel, which is um, Jewish. And I think there's a lot of conflict there, and I think I was really trying to figure out what their motivations are in terms of like, what their struggles are. And I think if you want to talk about Islam and violence, Palestine's probably the place you would go to try to go find it. And to be honest, I was staying in a refugee camp for a night, and there's, and talking, I lived with somebody who was in the refugee camp, and to be honest, their motivations have very little to do with violence. Like, so the average citizen, I would say, is totally not associated with the violent groups that are in that area of the world. Like, even, like, talking with him, like, he was saying the Palestinian, I don't know, maybe prime minister or president, like, there's so much corruption even in the government that, like, the, what the people want versus what the government even wants is, is what's saying to the media is so different because the people don't really have a voice there. So what the government is focused on is trying to deal with the violent issues, which is, I think, why there's so much exposure to the violence in the media. And the U.S. is picking up on that. And based on what the, the people were saying there is the violence is actually fueled by people like the U.S. government because we're the ones that are funding for the weapons to be supplied to people like the Israeli government, which is what's kind of starting a lot of the violence there. And, like, and the weapons that the Palestinians use, where are those coming from? Um, I th I'm not entirely sure, because based on what they were saying, like even the, the Arab countries bordering Palestine aren't really allied with Palestine. So Okay, how about like, um, what, do you th what do you make of the current uh, rise of ISIS and IS, ISIL, and so on. Right? What do you what do you make of that? And what we're seeing, and and the, and the Talib movement, the Taliban in Afghanistan, so Syria, right. Iraq. How do you make sense of that? Because they call themselves the Caliphate, the Muslim Caliphate. Right. I think. I mean, to be honest, the real answer is I don't know. But what I think is those groups are obviously extremists, and they're a very small number. But I think. To be honest, there's such a small group of the population, and we're focusing on them because they make for good news, and people will watch the news about what's happening with ISIS versus what's happening with regular people. Like, it's, it makes more money, which is why the media is talking about it. So, to be honest, I mean, I don't know what the real answer is. Did you go into Israel, by the way, on your trip? Yeah. Where'd you go? Um, I was in Jerusalem for three days, and then I went to... Bethlehem, which is in Palestine, where the yeah. separation wall is. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Were you in Jerusalem on Shabbat? Uh, yeah. On the, it's cool, right? Yeah, so in the old city, there's like different quarters. There's the Jewish quarter, which, is, which celebrates Shabbat, so it was really quiet. But then the Arab side was still like... Still rocking and rolling. Yeah, like, yeah. Open till midnight kind of thing. All right. Yes, ma'am. I was going to ask how you felt about how, um, after 9-11, how you think Americans' views of Islam kind of changed. Right, okay, so I, I, I have something to talk about this. So I was in Tel Aviv and there was a gallery that was showcasing um, like how Israelis felt about people around them and they used this quote that I think the Americans also use that I see in airports saying we will not forgive and we will not forget. 
So that's talking about um, like how we like were victims, and we will not forget that we were victims. So the in the side the art gallery, it's, it's like a contemporary art gallery. So there was a movie talking about um, basically how Israel as a country was a victim and how it turned into the aggressor because it was the victim. Because I think there's such a sense of fear that we're attacking instead of being neutral. Like previously we were victims, which is one in the spectrum, and to try to, comp I, I guess compensate isn't the best word, but to try to kind of neutralize where we are, they turn into aggressors like we have now, which is why I think we're going into so many different countries and mm -hmm. using our powers, I guess, with yeah. the army. You can make an argument that it's very similar with the Palestinians. By right, the way. right. That's how kind I feel of a thing. About it. All right, cool. All right, Jake, in order to do this, the first thing you got to do is pick out the darkest skin and the lightest skin person in class. All right. <laughs> Bring them down, invite them down to the front. <laughs> All right, the darkest, I'm going to say, is the guy in the back at the top. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Yo. I'm sorry, bro. <laughs> dude, I can't even see him, man. Yeah, dude, come on down. All right, the lightest. Who's the lightest? Mm. All right, I'm going to say the girl in the Penn State sweatshirt right here. Yeah? Yeah, she's pretty white. Who's that? Let me see. Stand up. Oh, totally. Oh, yeah. my God. So, <laughs> like, the light is beaming off of her. Yo, come on down real fast. Bro, come on down real fast. All right, right. What's your name? Sam. Sam? Yeah. Dude, nice name, man. Nice. And what's your name? Sean. Sean? Did you know he was going to pick you? Yep. Low key? Low key? <laughs> you didn't? Well, no, hang on, hang on. I need another mic. Oh, wait, hang on. Go ahead. All right, so like low, low key, I was scared. So I was talking to Lauren, and I was like, she's going to pick me. And he was like, maybe. But... Why didn't I, don't, you want, I don't know why you picked me, dog. I don't, why didn't you I want him to pick I don't you? Know why you picked me, dog. Wait, why didn't you want him to pick you? I just don't want to come up. Oh, I see. All right. <laughs> For this in particular. How about you? Wait, why this in particular? What about this in particular, bro? Because I don't know what's, You're crazy. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Dude, hang on. I mean, honestly, there's a lot of people I could have picked for either of you, but you okay. were just kind of standing out at the top, so it was, was easy to pick out. I was sitting down. I put my head down on purpose. Yeah, <laughs> so, so yeah but your boy thought, picked you out. He saw your he hair, like, and he thought your hair was just, ah, I get it. No. So, dude, say something about their skin, something meaningful. Look at them both right there. What do you want me to say about it? Ah, whatever, man. You volunteered. Your job. You're um, teaching the class now. Say something about the two of them that's meaningful. Teach the class something about them. They're both beautiful. Ah, oh, uh, dude. That's what I'm saying. All right. Now, say something else. Come on. What about skin? Look at their skin. Here, hang on, hang on. Hang on. No, look, at, look at their skin right here. What's what? How they get the color? How they get different skin tones? What happens when they're? It's in just he has more melatonin than her. Um. What's that? What's that? Say that again. Say that again. No, what did you say? More melatonin. Yeah, more melatonin. Yeah, all right, that's good. All right. But the reason it. is because when people started first moving out of Africa, everyone was first black, and then. Um, Basically, a genetic modification because uh, up in like Sweden and stuff, when your skin's lighter, it absorbs more vitamin D. The sweet. And so that's Where's why the people. Sweet? Yeah, go ahead. Got and it. that's why people became white in Europe and stuff like that. And that's why if you went from the middle of the country up, it would be like slowly fading to white because when your skin's not in the sun as much, it needs to absorb more vitamin D compared to if like the sun's out all day and all year round. Dude, you did. You killed it. All right. Did anybody have any questions for him? That was good. I learned that in another sociology class. All right, cool. Anybody have a question for him? So I have a question about the two volunteers. Yep. So, like, my first question is that how, how do you feel about, like, people of color bleaching their skin, not being proud of who they are, like, what they're born with? For him and yeah. for her, what's your question for and her? For her is, like, um... No, oh, it's the oh, opposite. Right, right, facts. So, like, how I, like, I don't understand, like, with tanning. It's like, when people tan, they get darker, but they don't like darker-skinned people, but they're darkening their pigmentations with... Okay, um, here, but let me, let me actually flip, the, I'm going to flip that question to Sam. I'm, let me actually, now hang on, I'm going to help you with the question. I'm going to just flip it. 
Sam, how do you feel about the fact that people who have really pale skin, such as yourself, have very, okay, um, little pigmentation in their skin, that actually feel kind of ashamed by it and wish they could get more tan? I that's mean, the, that's the, what tan. it is for white people. Um, I have no problem with being pale. I mean, I, I like getting tan. But what's the question again? Well, the question is, how do you feel about white people with skin like yours who feel kind of ashamed or like they don't like it? They wish they could tan more. It's their own body. Do what you want. Like, if you want to get tan, get tan. But you can't get tan. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You get red. I get red. I get very red. Are you happy about that? I mean, not when I get red because it sucks. It very much hurts. So if you could choose... I would get tan. You would get tan. I would get tan. Okay, that's his everyone question Everyone points to it you. out. What, what's behind that? I mean, everyone just says, like, oh, hey, you're so pale. Like, just go sit out in the sun for a little bit or something. Like, I know that. I know I'm pale. So the equivalent to him, then, is what do people say to him? Bro. What, Sean, what do people say to you? Yeah. <laughs> but it, the equivalent for you would be, well, you're so dark, you were a little bit lighter, whatever the case is, right? Do you ever hear that? So I, so I would say, so it's weird, right? I feel like between now and the past probably like a couple of years, in terms of just like me, like growing up and stuff like that, Attitudes like shift, right? So when you're when you're younger, um, and I grew up in New York, but I went to so I grew up in, where I grew up was like majority black neighborhood, blah blah blah. But I went to school with majority white people, right? So when I was growing up, it was a lot of like anti-blackness kind of things, like oh you're so dark, yeah, 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 this that and the third. Um, and then going to high school too, it was a bit different because I went to high school with, with it was different. It was a whole lot of black people I went to high school with, which was better for me in theory, but at the same time it was kind of like. It was kind of mixed. And then when I got to college, it was a lot of like what she said. It was a lot of, oh, your skin is this and that. Your skin is beautiful, this and that, right? And I think that when you get older and when you lose a lot of ignorance and a lot of anti-blackness that's kind of like rooted socially within everybody here, um, attitudes shift and things kind of change, right? So for me now, my attitude towards me being dark-skinned or whatever the case mm -hmm. may be is different from when I was five, six, seven years old in elementary school till now when I'm in college and I'm about to graduate, you know what I mean, so. Cool, but. all right, man, do you have anything you wanna to respond, you wanna to say to that? I guess I agree with what he was saying. I think that attitudes have shifted towards dark skin, like younger, when we were younger, elementary school, middle school, you know, it wasn't, oh my God, your skin's so beautiful, it was, you're so dark, uh, we can't see you when the light's off, you know, like that type of stuff, but now From your friends, not from white people, right? I mean, I mean, white people aren't saying, we can't see you in the lights. I up, wasn't, right? I yeah. didn't go to school with any white people or anything right, like okay. that. So I didn't experience that from them. But yep. yeah, I just agree with him. Like, you know, when we were younger, it wasn't a good thing. Now that we're older, it's a trend now and everybody likes chocolate skin. Mm-hmm, dude. Hey, listen, so let me say the following on this. We're gonna talk about skin, by the way. Like, this is one of these really highly political things for white people who like don't, especially white people who don't see color kind of things, you know what I mean? <laughs> I didn't even notice you were black. Oh my gosh. <laughs> didn't notice. I saw the, Sean, you, you and Sam, I just thought you were the same people. All right. Anyway, white people, <laughs> yo, white people, don't do that, okay? You don't have to do that. That's not what it means. I understand why, people, I understand why white people do that because we're taught that if we, mention color at all, it means we're racist. So the extreme of that is then we say, oh, we don't see color, which is simply absurd. So it's like, no, 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 it's okay to see color. The point is, okay, but what I wanna say is, what's interesting, Sam, is that white, white people have not had, because we've not experienced, because really light and pale skin has historically speaking been politicized in a positive way. It's been seen as a really good thing. White people now haven't had the similar kind of political liberation, say for you, to say, no, actually pale skin is fine because white people get shamed. If you have really pale skin, and I think a lot of black and, black and brown people don't understand this, if you have really pale skin, you get shamed into having pale skin, right? Like Sam, you just, you said, like, 
People say, oh, you're so pale. They don't mean that in a positive way. No one is anyone ever saying to you, oh, you're so pale. That's so beautiful. It's so lovely. It's great. I mean, <clears throat> if you were in Korea, maybe. No, hang on. I'm asking you that question. Can you? Does anyone ever say that in a positive way? I mean, I've gotten like one person who said that and I was just like, like who said like, oh, you're so pale. And I was like, yeah, I know. And they were like, oh, it's beautiful. Like you're beautiful. Like okay. You're beautiful anyway, right? Anyway. And the subtext is, it's just like, you know, what you were saying and Sean, what you were saying when you were younger, it's a similar kind of thing. It, it really is that you're actually, you're kind of ugly and it's really bad to have pale skin that's the subtext i'm not saying that by the way you're lovely and, but you get that right and so i think that a lot of times we don't understand that white people it's not the same thing so black people in particular understand i'm not saying it's the same thing it's not the same thing it's just the the corollary of what happens with white people is sometimes there's a similar kind it's a it's a very interesting thing anyway cool thanks man thanks for standing thanks everybody Cool. Wait. Cool. Are we done? Nice. Dude. Nice. Um, personally, I think that especially I'm speaking on behalf of like not as behalf as the black community, but in my personal experience with the police. Um, well, no, hang on, hang on, hang on. No, you're teaching the class. I, you got to teach them something, not just from personal experience. You got to say like, okay, so listen, let me explain to you this thing about okay. da, da, da. Okay, so let me explain to you about police brutality in mainly urban city areas. So in cities such as like Philly, New York, I'm just going to say Philly, New York, we, Chicago too, okay, um, Detroit too, honestly. We are, we grow up with this thought of not liking the police automatically. Like when we're born, we're just taught to, if the police come, you either run or you turn away. It's also this no snitching policy, so we just don't talk to police. That's just something that we, that's engraved into our system, and it's something that the cycle continues inside all black communities everywhere. Honestly, we don't talk to police because the police are not for us. The police don't protect the way they're supposed to protect, at least not for the black community. Hey, can you say more about that historically? Like, where does that come from? So, historically, it stems from, it mainly stems from usually Caucasian people having the authority inside America. And when they have the authority, they don't do the correct thing with their authority. So, basically, they, uh, they abuse the fact they have the authority over other people. And inside black communities especially, it stems from police, when they, like, how do I explain this? They pretty much put patrol cars inside of all black neighborhoods to monitor black people and see what they were doing. So when the patrol cars came and they started making small arrests, the police and black people started to come in contact more, but not inside, not the pr proper way to come in contact with police. It was more in negative manners. If you see them, you're probably locking me up, questioning me about my friend or patting me down with the stop and frisk. Right. So it just stems from a long time ago. All right, cool. All right, Ethan, what's your geek? Teach us something about police violence, right? I put violence in quotes, right? Because it's relative. And, and racism. And you can define racism any way you want. And you can say it whatever you want, however you want to do it, anything. All right. Um, so I'll start out by saying that, I mean, my hand shot up right away because I actually was hoping that this would be one. I, because I, mean, I, I like this topic. Yep. Um, not be, I don't really have a strong view one way or the other, but I have very strong opinions about this topic, uh, mainly in the case of just the mass blame that all cops get for a few bad apples. Okay, so remember, you're teaching the class about it. So your first lesson, your first statement is, yeah, cops get, th there are a few bad apples for sure, and cops get blamed in mass for things. Okay, cool. Go ahead, man. Cool. Uh, I think that that goes with, Almost every stereotype, though, I mean, whether it's blacks or the like Islam side that we had. Mm -hmm. I mean, whenever there's like someone, it's the same thing. Whenever there's a a crime committed by maybe a black person, and it's related to gangs, or when there's a 
a crime committed by someone who's Muslim and it's an act of terror, but then when like a white person could commit that same crime, it's not really seen as like a terrorist act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that like when it comes down to it though, with the whole uh, like Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, uh, I think a big issue is just the response that comes from maybe the African American community or police officers who take it into their own hands. I think that's the only thing that needs to stop when one racist cop goes over the line, maybe even kills a black person that did not deserve it. And then the response from possibly a black member of the community is to turn and shoot two pigs in the back. I'm not saying that that happens all the time. I'm just saying that that's specifically not the answer. Yeah. On one hand, but on another hand, you have the fact that cops that will do these things, I, I think you guys all know about like the body cams that the police sometimes wear now, just to kind of enforce this. I don't really think that's the answer either. I'm not saying that we should just let them go. I'm saying like, who gets a body cam? Like, do all police officers get a body cam? Do some police officers get a body cam? Do police officers that are more likely to? Yeah. I don't think it. I just don't think there's a point mm -hmm. because when it comes to the point of like, maybe we should just give body cams to police officers that are like, potentially racist. Potentially racist police officers just shouldn't be police officers. Like, you shouldn't have potentially racist police officers. All right. All right. Cool, man. All right, dude. All right. This is for you. So you Wait, said. Wait, you? Who's you? The one in the white shirt. Ethan. Yes, Ethan. All right, so you said that racist cops should get body cams, but how would you point out cops that are racist? Well, good question. All right. Yep. I don't know if I said it wrong or if you heard it wrong. I basically said that that shouldn't happen because there just shouldn't be racist cops, period. Yeah. Yeah, not all cop. Right, exactly. Not all cops. I was posing that as a suggestion when we talk about body cam issues, like because obviously every cop can't get a body cam. Not only is it just not logical, it also is going to affect them in their line of duty as well. Because when right. you talk about like a cop's job is to protect us, so when they're worried about you know going in somewhere to protect someone, but then they got to oh wait, let me put my camera on real quick like make sure it's recording all that or or alternative let me turn it off because i'm going yeah, pulling no, somebody over yeah go ahead man like i went on a civil rights tour to the south um to a couple of states in tennessee and alabama and it's so different like when you see the towns the black communities they're so different from let me say State College or any other town in the north. And then I took a couple of lessons that presentation is really important, like how you present yourself. Um, you could be a good person, but the way that you present yourself could put you in a position whereby you, uh, you become a stereotype because of the way that you present yourself. So I think that's something that we need to work on as black people. Okay. Be honest. Yeah. All right. Destiny, you take that. Do you ever... um, I, I Is... understand. Go ahead, go ahead. I understand where you're coming from exactly with the way, the way you present yourself is the way everybody's going to judge you because everybody has first impressions. Everybody judges everybody. So I understand where you're coming from. But at the same time, it's just as black people, and I'm pretty sure every black person here can relate going to a PWI, you have to present yourself in a certain way in order for certain people to accept you. And inside the black community, we are... We know how to, what is known as code switching, which is how we talk when we're around our friends versus how we talk when we're inside the corporate world or inside school. So I understand where you're coming from and how we need to, I guess, act better as a community. But at the same time, certain things that we do, certain things that we say, we are allowed to say because we are turning a trial into a triumph, honestly. Certain things that we say and certain things that, the way we act and the way we make jokes about everything, the way we laugh at everything, the way we, Mm. The way we support everybody else, or like if you see a big circle of like people dancing, you see the black people hyping them up. That's just the way we are. We are. We have taught ourselves how to come back up over something that's really small. Or like if people beat us down, we taught ourselves how to come back up. So I think certain things are stereotypes, and certain things we do act like. But if it's the way our personality is, if that's the person's personality, they are allowed to act like that. I hope I just answered your question. All right. 
All right. <laughs> so, like, when he said... Um, Ethan. Make, no. Oh, this guy. Yeah. yeah. So, like, when he said make a change, one community is building frustration while the other one is just watching what's on the news. So how can there be an equal change if there's two different experiences? Dude, good question, man. And if you're not, if you're not privy to race relations in the United States, mind you, and that is the beginning of the conversation about race relations in the U.S. It's like we're not starting at the same place. And so a lot of times we're, we're trying to, we can only imagine that if we're going to start moving somewhere, we got to start, we got to all have to start together, but we're starting at different places. So, um, yeah, one final one. Yes. Quick shout out to uh, Tanner's dad who's watching the stream. Cool, uh, man. <laughs> Dude, what's his name? Tanner's dad? Tanner's dad. Dude, dad. Nice having you. <laughs> My question is for both of you, and it's, uh, do you think you can be racist to white people? Wait, to both? Wait. All right. Um, short answer, no. Not possible, because in order to be racist, you have to be on the side of prejudice, pre prejudice and y'all have never been on that side. Not saying y'all is not you, but like white people as a whole, we can't be racist towards you if there's nothing to be racist about when y'all are still in power, honestly. I'm allowed to respond. Yeah. I, Wait. Go ahead. Just real quick to answer it, I'm probably going to disagree only because I think that obviously black people can be racist to white people. I would agree with you with the point that you were saying, but I would word it differently. I would say that there's not oppression yeah. when it goes the opposite way, obviously. Yeah. But racism, obviously, like, I mean, that's, I feel like that's kind of what it is when black people attack a white person or, like, a black person shoots, like, a white cop because they're not Yeah, really no, or it just even says th racist things about someone. Yeah, so that's with why Destiny, I just changed the word to oppression because I think... Okay, so what Destiny here is getting at, we'll, we'll talk, we're going to talk about this in class. It's really a matter Whoa. of defining concepts, and we will we'll get into that. So, yep, the ways in which a lot of people see that. So we are from Chile, yeah. in, in your visiting. Talk right into the mic. Thank Teach you. us something about the end bomb. Um, excuse me, what is the, the end bomb? What is that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, he'll, he'll go first. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Dude, that's beautiful. All right. Wait, let's find out. Wait, how many? <laughs> oh, 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 maybe I don't understand. No, 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 you don't understand. This is beautiful. How many of you don't know what the end bomb is? Wait, one? Seriously, you don't know either? Two? Anyone else? It's, you shouldn't know. You shouldn't necessarily know. Hang on a sec. Okay. Bro, what do you think it is? Wait, wh wh no, I actually know what it is. <laughs> oh, you do know what it is? Bro, who else said, do you know what it is or do you have an idea? You don't have any idea? Really? Okay, hang on. What do you think it is? Wait, hang on, hang on. Pass the mic down to that dude. This is going to be great. Wait, can you stand up, actually? So, the first time I saw the word M-bound on the screen, I, I think of the World War II that American people did in Japan. So I really have no idea about M-bound. Whoa, all right. That's wild. Where are, you, like, where, are you, where are you from? I'm from China. From China? So I really don't have the cultural background of the M-bound. So I, okay. ask, I asked her, and uh, she explained something to me, but I still don't get across. What is, wait, okay, wait, hang on. What, is she, what did she say? She... Uh, wait, cause are you getting him? Are you getting him on the she, overhead team? She um, spelled a word on, his, on, on her phone. <laughs> she, she, she said she cannot, she, she cannot say the word. <laughs> wait, is... Wait, is that the white woman sitting there or the brown woman? Yeah. The white woman? Yeah. Yeah, dog, she can't say that word, right? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Wait, can you say it, though? You're, like, you're mixed. Hang on, we'll get to you. All right, thanks. You can pass the mic this way. All right. 
<laughs> All right. Bro, so okay. what you know is it's a word you can't say. Okay, okay. we're going to start there. Okay. You're going to figure, we're going to see if you can figure it out. Be- okay. Go ahead, man. Yeah, give them, no, they teach them something about, yeah, what would you teach the world? Yeah, you're, te- okay, so you're teaching him, and you're teaching him about the N-bomb. So the N-word, it was originally, like, really originated when there was slavery going on in this country, and it was a word that was used to demean um, black people, people from Africa, just people, you know, almost like if they were colored, they would almost be either called the N-word or called colored. And that's where it started. And now, transitioning into our, our society today, I would say I've lived all over the place. And if I live in a white community, well, predominantly white community, I hear the word going around as if, if, as if it was a normal word and like just not with the hard R, which I guess makes it worse. And then I've also lived in Philadelphia where uh, white people would really like refrain from saying it. I would say like, the minority groups and, you know, like black people, they say it and it's fine. But I would say like white people in areas that are not predominantly white would always refrain from it just because I guess, you know, like they're either scared or, you know, they don't want to say it or they're not comfortable saying it. And I feel like um, a lot of my black friends and if I have used the N-word, um, they're not like bashing me for it, maybe because I'm not white. And I feel like it's more widely accepted now than it was ever before, but in some communities, it's more like, you know, not accepted. So do, like you, before. D- do you drop it with an R at the end or an A at the end? A at the end. And uh, give me a situation in which you might drop it. Because he still doesn't. <laughs> he still doesn't know yet. Like. What's the situation in which you might drop it with your friends? All the black people are holding their breath right now. <laughs> They're like, come on, man. Don't dig a hole for yourself. And go up to, you know, probably my black friend. Just be like, yo, what's up? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, all right. Where'd you learn that? Huh? Where did you learn that? I actually learned it. So when I came to America, I lived in like a a more Latino town, and I heard the word being thrown around, and I was like, you know, like, what does that word mean? And I talked to my cousins, and they were like, yo, don't say it, it's not good, you know, refrain from it, and it just never got brought up in conversation, and uh, then I just kind of started hearing it in, like, on some, some videos on YouTube, World Star, and, like, that's, that's when I, like, started, like, learning about it again, and I was like, okay. so I asked a black person, because I, I, like, I've clued it together, like, you know, I see a lot of black people using it, so I just want to ask them what it is. And I had a lot of black friends that I was comfortable with, and I asked them what it meant, and they were like, yeah, like, it comes from this and comes from this, and they just told me because, you know, I was comfortable with them, and, like, and it wasn't did, a big did, deal. Okay, final question, and then you're on, bro. Did anyone ever, one of your friends ever literally give you permission to say it? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. like, yeah, you can say it, man. <laughs> Did they give you the context within which you could say it? Or, like, you listen around these people, but don't say it around so-and-so? Or like, uh, No, I mean, it's that? just like, it's like, it's more of a norm thing, like, fit it into context more than just like, they're not like, oh, you're not, you're not allowed to say it, you're not allowed Okay, I got it. Yeah. Yeah, you, you should, you're allowed to say it, nothing like that, I feel like ever came up with me personally. Okay. All right, so it's Nicholas. Yeah. So, yeah. W- the end, so give us what you know about the end bomb. Oh, I think I, now I know the, the the word. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I'm from Chile, and there um, we listen uh, this uh, word a lot. But uh, where do you hear the word? Um, I don't know. Uh, the same, uh, maybe YouTube, uh, social medias, uh-huh. and uh, yeah. When I came here, uh, I. Learned that this uh, uh, word I can say uh, normally to whatever uh, any. Um, you learn you can't say that. Yeah. Would you ever? Do you hear people saying it in Chile? Um, yeah, maybe, but uh, it's not common there. Yeah. I think, well, because the Spanish. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, um, I hear about that. Uh, yeah. Word. So more on like it's on not the media. Used to, to 
to you. Have you heard that you're not supposed to say it? Um, or that it's a bad word or whatever? I think at one time I, I, I didn't know, but I say, say the, the word and um, my girlfriend there told me that I, I don't have to uh, say that because, yeah, yeah. I yeah, because you could, yeah, it could be some kind of way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Who's got a question? So my name's Sophie. Uh, I'm actually Venezuelan, so I understand where you're coming from, not really know, knowing what the N-word means here, but um, do you think that the way that we use it in Spanish and in South America is different than the way that is used here because of context and stuff? I think, uh, yes, have a, a different, I don't know, uh, because uh, I, I, don't, I usually don't use the, the word in my... Uh, me, what's what's the worst swear word you use in Chile? What's like the um, worst thing you can say in Chile? Um, uh, maybe ah, uh, we have a, a very similar word, but you you can use the the word uh, weon. Weon. Yeah, and you, you can say it to your friend. Yeah, they like yeah? teach us. So if we go to Chile, if anybody goes to Chile, they can like. Yeah, uh, in, in Chile. Um, you can say this word to your friend, but if you say uh, to uh, a person who you don't know, like or your professor, yeah, you, you can say well to your professor. Yeah. It, it's so so bad. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. All right. Somebody else. And one more question. So like hypothetically, if you don't have the end card and it comes out when you're like singing a song or whatever, should there like be repercussions or? Dude, let's ask him. Like, when you're singing along in a song and it comes out, it's in the song, do you say it or do you not say it? I think it's just, like, what you're personally comfortable with. I always say it. It's never been a problem. And, like, I've said it, like, many times even before I knew what the word meant, and it was never a problem. It wasn't a problem after I said it. And I think it's just, like, you just go with it. If you really avoid it, like, you can, but it's not really a big deal. Like, you're just, you're just making a statement if you do avoid it. Dude, listen, black people, the Indian guy is speaking for all of you, so you want to say something, like, whatever. That's his, that's, he's only saying that's his vision. Anyone else want to say? So, real quick. Um, Wait, is this Sean again? Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> dude. My man on the right, why do you think you or your other non-black counterparts, mm-hmm. if I use that word, um, why do you guys have such a desire to use the word? even if it's in a song. That's my only thing, right? That's my only thing. That's a good question. Good, good, good question. All right, that's a cool question. What's the, where's the desire to use the word come from, even if it's in a song or whatever? Cool question, man. Okay. I think... Um, just for you, just speak just, for you. Where's the desire to I would use say it like, from? I would say there's no certain desire to say it. I would say um, the culture that I have grown up in and like the way I learned, it was always generally accepted, and it was never... Uh, you know, just brought up to me, be like, I mean, especially when I first came here, they're like, don't say it, and I didn't, and I really didn't know why. And then after that, when I started living in Philadelphia, I started learning what it was, and it came up in normal speech. I didn't go out of my way to say it. I just yeah. said it, and I never had, like, a desire, like, oh, I'm singing a song just for the reason of saying the N-word. No, I got you. So it's, it becomes like, for example, any, anybody, when we're young people and we learn to swear, let's just, let's just put it on the level of language and we learn to kind of swear. Where is that, you know, if, if people around you are using certain words like shit or whatever, or what was it again? What's the Chilean word? Weon. Uh, Weon. Weon. If you're starting to say weon, you're going to just start to say weon because you kind of want to fit in with your friends. So you, what you're saying is you, okay, so you got all these black friends. They're saying it. They're like, you want to, you just want to fit in with them. So you're going to say it like somebody else who grows up in central Pennsylvania or like in Pittsburgh, you all say yins. It's like, why do you say yins? It's not even a word, but you do, right? So you fit in and you're like yins. All right, yins. So it's some of the, that's the cool question. Thanks, man. Anybody else? Any final thing? Anyone want to say anything? Or are we good to go? Wait, I do. I have a question. No, I do have a question, actually, for um, somebody who's black, who's got white friends, and you're hanging out, and you've got the music playing. Wait, is that, dude, do you have white friends? Yeah, dude. All right. You have white friends, too? I'll tell you. All right, man, you ready, bro? So you have white friends. You're singing a tune. The, 
on the end bomb it comes up and you got to drop it do you drop it and you got white people you're not really sure are cool or not do you drop it or you just like not say it do you do i drop it yeah do you do you say it or do you not say it no i say it i'm black all right <laughs> so you say eat around white friends it's cool you say it doesn't really matter that's my question like do you like say nah i don't want to reinforce this i feel like I feel like especially on a, an athletic team where you have so many different cultures and people from ethnic backgrounds and different geographical destinations, one, the white kids on our team, I think, have enough respect and understanding because they've been around us enough that they don't even have to question whether to say it or not. They just kind of listen to the song as we vibe out. Yeah, yeah, I got you. So it's All like right. I could still say it. All right, dude. Cool, man. So pretty much um, it's a movement of women coming out. Um, when they're like sexual assaulted, sexually assaulted and like raped and stuff. And um, a lot of the situations happened like way in the past, but they're all coming out now and they're like, me too, this happened to me um, because they've been oppressed and they haven't been able to um, speak up. So now they are. And that's kind of what the movement is doing. And it's like in, um, like the sister movement, I guess, is the Time's Up movement, which is like trying to stop the um, sexual assault from happening, pretty much. What's Time's Up? What is that? Time's Up is another... Um, hashtag that people are hashtag, using? Hashtag, yeah, for sexual assault and okay. raising awareness for it and trying to stop it. Okay, so Me Too then. Mm -hmm. Do you know how it got started? I don't know how it got started, but I just started reading about it and like getting into it more when the Harvey Weinstein stuff happened. Mm -hmm. And I just, I don't know a lot of how it started or a lot of how it happened, but I think it is really important because this stuff happens like way too much. Like, and it happens so often, like no one knows about it ever, unless and, you speak up. And do you know people? Yes. Mm hmm. Okay. Women, I should say. Do you know women? Yes. And, and men. Is it for men also? Um, I mean, it's are men not, using the hashtag? I, they're not using it. It's more, it's basically like, I don't want to say 100%, but it's basically like all towards women. But um, that isn't saying that there aren't sexual assaults that men are the victims of. Uh, how do you feel about the some women in the Me Too movement, how they give like accusations that aren't true and it's ruining some men's lives how do you feel about that um yeah i think that part is really bad about it like i mean obviously you're just not honest or like really that good of a person if you're trying to bring someone's whole life down with something like that and i think those types of situations even though they happen i don't think that's like really what Me Too is like geared towards, I guess. Um, a lot of people happen to believe that this whole Me Too movement is surrounded about women thinking that they just need a, a moment in the spotlight. What is your reaction to that? Um, I really don't think it's just a moment in spotlight type of thing because um, like this could be some woman's secret that she's been keeping for 10 or 20 years, depending on how old you are. And I doubt she's just gonna like come out and use all that courage to just like get one minute of fame. Mm -hmm. That's the way I look at okay, it. Okay, cool. Understandable that um, there are certain cases that may be false accusations and whatnot. With those cases, do you feel like there should be repercussions for the female or the victim or proposed victim as to, you know, potentially trying to ruin someone else's life out of, life out of spite or hatred or whatever it may be? Did, did you say take different precautions? What, no. Sorry, can you say it again? Repercussions, like punishment of like whatever it may be, be it fines. Oh, punishment for like yeah. lying about that? Yeah. Oh, um, I mean, yeah, because that didn't happen. So, I mean, it would be really hard, but I bet there's like some way that you could figure out if it like really did actually happen or not, and then they can like get like defamation of character or something. Okay, one final question. Yes, ma'am. 
Um, I just want to come back to the ruining men's lives because obviously you can still become president of the United States with sexual assault allegations. So True. regardless of if make you it, did it or make not, it, it, make, make it a, this make it a question. Yep. Okay. Um, do you think that it actually ruins men's lives when they become president of the United States, even if they have several sexual allegations against them? Um, probably should not be like no, that. No, hey, hang on. Ever. We're going to make it an Where open end. Is doing Wait, that. hang on, hang on, hang on. Before you answer, <laughs> we're going to make it an open ended question. How much do you think it ruins men's lives when, in fact, they can then go on, when they have credible allegations against them? And when they've admitted it themselves, in fact, and then go on and become president of a country like the United States, how much? How much it ruins their lives? Yep. Well, I mean, obviously not really that much if you see all these people like being accused. I mean, some like obviously Harvey Weinstein, that's like a whole mess. Kevin Spacey's getting like charged or whatever. But um, a lot of these people, you like hear about it happen in the news and it's big for like maybe a couple months and then you like never hear about it again and everybody goes back to normal. So okay. it's not really ruining their lives that much. Okay. Okay. Thanks, ma'am. Appreciate it. Um, I'm going to say this about this topic, what I'm about to say, because I just think it's really important to build uh, a sense of understanding of where we're at and where we're going to be. Um, According to the numbers of sexual assault, a very high number of women and a much lower and yet extraordinarily surprisingly high number of men, um, not much lower, but a lower number of men, um, are sexually assaulted before the age of 20 or 21 or certainly throughout their lives. And that means that most of you in here, a very high percentage of you in here have had the experience, some experience of sexual assault. And it's, it, in some ways, it's, it can be, if we go by the numbers, okay, starting as children, if we go by the numbers, and I want to put this in perspective here, if, could, could just, just so we can do this, can everybody in this Hang on. The first, everyone in the first section, except these two rows, can you all just stand up? All right. Okay. So this is about the number of people in this classroom who have already experienced sexual assault in some way. Unwanted sexual touching, unwanted behavior, unwanted something that's sexual, that's really not just, you know, a, a pat on the back or something. Like, no, no, no. That's how many people. So this is, this is, this is a really serious issue. And, and you look at, look at how many people are just in this classroom, y'all, right? Just in the classroom. So, yeah. And so I, I, I certainly appreciate the idea of, like, you know, the question, we ask a question about, you know, men's lives and what about women who lie? Well, it's like, eh, you know, but and that's an important question. And it's a question that white people often bring up about experiences of, of discrimination. Well, well, what did you do? Well, what's your role in it? Well, well what could you have done? Or, well, is that really what happened? Or is that, that, that it's always, you know, because you don't want to believe these things. Anyway, first up, go sit down. Thanks. Um, and I'll, we'll talk, maybe I'll just start next class talking about, a case, like, what we know and how we know it. Maybe we'll just start right there, because I actually have a really good story that we could talk about that really matters. And so um, these are all really, those are, these are good questions. But, but they're all, and this, these are also really serious issues. So the reason I stopped on that and, and just said a few things, and I haven't on any of the other topics, is because this is, this is really, this is deeply personal to a very large number of us. And everybody, all of us, every single one of us knows people and many, many people who have 
experienced. Um, sexual assault, sexual... I don't like to use... There are certain words that people use a lot, like violence. And it's like, yes, yeah, sometimes that's the perfect word, but oftentimes it's... Yeah, it's just finding a way to talk about this stuff that feels real, so... Anyway, so we're going to have really honest and open conversations in here about stuff, okay? But also it's really important that we trust each other to be able to go to the places that we need to go to. White nationalists are these guys who have been... So these guys? Yeah. <laughs> they're, uh, they're a bit of a special bunch. Um, if there's any white nationalists in the room, I'm about to offend you, but I don't really care about you anyway, so, you know... There's uh, high, it's not likely there are any white nationalists. There might be a few. You'd be surprised. Right you'd be surprised. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Yeah, you're right. You're right. The guy in the Flyers jersey, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah. I wouldn't put that evil on him. All no. right. I got it. Okay. Well. So they are basically sort of bought into this ideology that goes all the way back, like even past like what you think of like Hitler and like the neo-Nazi movement, but all the way back to the origins of like slavery and European imperialism and eugenics and all this stuff, this idea that because your skin is a certain tone, you're like better than everybody else and that there should be some sort of like white separatist movement where all the white people move to Oregon and they create this beautiful like capitalist utopia because everybody's white so there's no crime and everything's perfect and also no gays, so you know. That's that's kind but of their also deal. No gays, you got to throw that in. Oh good. yeah, there's there's a lot of intersection between like racism and homophobia and transphobia and stuff like that because they think it's edgy to hate on people who don't have as much power as them because they feel emasculated by the economic system that they're in. Because beforehand, if you were a white man in America, especially like 20s, 30s, 40s, all the way up to really like the mid 70s. You could just like get a high school education, get a good job, often a union job that will allow you to buy a house and support a family and be the sole breadwinner. And now because economic conditions have changed and wages have been depressed and unions have been totally obliterated and shipping jobs overseas and... <laughs> there we go. All right. Is that a shut up whistle or a keep going whistle? <laughs> oh yeah, no, dude. They're like yeah. they're really uh, they're really yeah. appreciating yeah. Bernie Sanders socialism. Uh, I'm I'm further left than him, but thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> All right, wait, hang on. Let me see if we got a question for you. Yeah. Can you talk about how the alt right recruits people and like preys on suburban white kids? Yeah. So a lot of times there's recruitment done through the internet or just like through like friends or friends of friends and associates. And they often target kids who are normally either entering adolescence or in adolescence, so they're feeling like weird and vulnerable because hormones and they're becoming adults, so they have more responsibilities and they're thinking, oh crap, I'm gonna graduate high school, what am I gonna do with my life? And unfortunately, there's also a lot of these people maybe suffer from untreated mental health issues, which is sad because they are, they could, with the right, like, help and medication and stuff. I, I'm on medication. Oh, wait, hang on, hang shit. on. Oh, wait, and hang on, hang on. All right. Okay, hang on. We got that. All right, next one. Yes. Dude, you're the best. I'm telling you. All right, yes, go ahead. Good hey, Lord, Leslie. I look a mess. Uh, I just want to say, hey, I went to your high school. <laughs> My name is Oh, hey. What's up? <laughs> wow. Um, I'm just curious to see um, what is your answer to this question. So how did your upbringing affect your interest in this topic and your opinions right now? I mean, my parents didn't talk a lot about politics, believe it or not. So I'm, this isn't just like, oh, you just think this because you're indoctrinated or whatever. Nah. I mean, like, my parents were like, my mom was like an old school, like, Vietnam War protester. So uh, we're, we've been known for raising havoc, but they didn't really, they let me form my own opinions. So I kind of, I got older, I learned more about history and the government and intersections between all these different social groups and um, material conditions in a lot of different societies and I did a lot of reading and formed some opinions and then got loud and boisterous about them because that's what I do. Have you met any black people who are white nationalists? Black people who are white nationalists? Yeah. No. I have. No? You, you've met black people who are I white nationalists? Okay. My friend. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. 
Nice. Yeah. I'll see if I can bring one in. So global warming, like, I hope everyone believes in that, um, is an issue. And it's causing national, like, ice caps are melting, ocean levels are rising. And as a result, like, a lot of coastal areas, um, small islands like the Philippines and stuff like that, might not be around within the next like 20 years. And those people that live there are gonna be forced out of there to wherever, and we have to accommodate them or try and limit the reactions of global warming. Mm -hmm. Okay, Morgan, number two. Mm -hmm. um, like over 50% of the world's population lives within 50 miles of a coastline. So with rising, ocean levels that's going to displace like billions of people and the people that face the biggest impacts of climate change especially right now are people in poverty that don't have the ability to move very easily or have access to like clean water and food as much either so the, look at look at the two of you look at this room of people right you just said some really intense what you what, if i re, if i interpret what the two of you just said it basically is that nobody in this classroom, by the time you get to be my age, the world, your world is going to be really, really, really different. So how are they going to be affected? Um, I think there'll be a lot of overpopulation issues because um, we're going to have to accommodate so many people. And it, I feel it would be unethical to just reject them. Like, there's a lot of refugee issues that are going on. And like, the, like these folks here. Yeah, and we're kind of turning a blind eye to it, but it's become a serious issue, and we're going to have to take action against it, and it's not going to be like, oh, we can just ignore it. So where in the United States are we going to, where, where are we going to run into this? Already you know? all along the coastlines in, like, Miami, New Orleans, and, like, in the south down there, Gulf of Mexico especially. Yeah, so like New Orleans is going to be gone. Yeah. Like I think I, I read that it, by the time you, most of you are like my age, a third of Florida is going to be underwater. So it's like, I don't know where you're going to go on. Like where are you going to go for, where, where are your kids going to go for spring break? You know what I mean? <laughs> going to go to Fort Lauderdale? Like what are they going to do? <laughs> who else, who has a question? My name is Rob, by the way. My question for either of you who want to answer it is, there are earlier projections like you see in uh, Al Gore's 2001 film, An Inconvenient Truth, that already predicted a lot of these coastlines and a lot of these land masses to have been underwater by years before today. Um, going forward, you were saying that these same things are going to happen when these estimates were made 20 years ago, that by now it would be there, and it's not. So I'm not, like, I'm not a climate change denier. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you, make all, you hear all these estimates about people going underwater, but the rate of change so far has been one that has been relatively like, able. I mean, people have been able to move because the rate of change has been so slow. What is your perspective on these estimates and the legitimacy of the rate of change of the sea levels? Bro, that, what's your name again? Rob. Rob? Yeah. That is by far the best question of the two days. Can you respond to that? Do you guys have a response to that? Um, I don't know what the timeline on like the estimates is, but like realistically, um, it's eventually going to become a problem. Maybe not within the next 50 years. I don't know when. Do you know when it was estimated at all? Yeah, Al Gore is inconvenient truth. So go back, you know, 16 years or so. Um, but. It's definitely going to become a problem at some point in time, and like we need, can take action now to help alleviate it, and or we could just continue to do our own thing and care about America or ourselves. So your take is that it's going to happen. Yeah. If the, whatever the timeline is, it's going to happen. Morgan, number two. Also, um, maybe the impacts of it aren't as largely felt in the United States right now because we are a pretty well-developed country, but in other countries, and in like India, and like I think you were saying the Philippines, and countries that don't have as much infrastructure to handle the impacts of climate change are already you know, suffering incredibly. And I think it's maybe not what we see on the news most importantly every mm -hmm. day, I guess. Not saying that it isn't important, it is, but mm -hmm. not like the headlines right now. No, this, this shot is actually Bangladesh. And Bangladesh, it's an area of Bangladesh that's flooded every year because that's just the nature of it. But the flooding in the past 
like five years or so has been unprecedented in a way that they've just never possibly experienced. Bro. Can I answer that question real quick? This one? Yeah. Rob's question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's so, your name? I'm Justin. Justin. And um, I just want to mention that it's not just the sea level rising, it's the climate change in general. As the, um, the storm that you've seen throughout the um, southern part of the U.S., especially the one that hit Houston, that was really big. And I think, I think it did more damage in Katrina from what I've heard. Mm -hmm. so, so it's not just sea level. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not just the sea levels. It's also the ecosystem. It's the storms and yep. different weather conditions. We had more snow this year, too. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, man.